Uh, the, the idea for this seminar came from, uh, uh, this is the book on which it is based, and it came from reading of uh, a man named Porges, or Porges, who uh, came, uh, talked about uh, the concept of the vagal tone, vagal nervous system, which he calls the social nervous system. And his theory is that uh, in humans, particularly in mammals, uh, there is a nervous system which governs our relationships. And that involves uh, a, a major feedback system from body experience, that is self-experience, that colors the way in which we interact with people, whether with warmth or with fear. And uh, the vagal nervous system is uh, associated with facial expression, with hearing, with vocal tone, uh, and physiologically it is associated with a heart rate, uh, epigastric function, digestion, uh, assimilation, and lower bowel function. And in reading this, it occurred to me that this is a perfect example of a traditional Chinese concept called San Zhao. San Zhao, or triple warmer, is associated with the three heaters, and also included that is Shen. And Shen is a uh, uh, mysterious term which is m often mistranslated uh, as mind. But it is more, I think, about attitude. It is about how we experience ourselves and others in relationship. It is about um, communication. I think is much clearer uh, translation. We'll look at some of those, the character later on. So I was very taken with Porges and his concepts because here we had a modern example of a traditional Chinese medical insight. And I think that's one of the things that I've attempted to do for the last decade is to translate some of these concepts into modern language, into more scientific language. The insights of these, uh, these masters, these traditional practitioners was amazing their intuition, their grasp of situations, their capacity to make diagnosis based on simple things like observation, questioning, pulse, tongue diagnosis, uh, and other considerations is quite amazing that they had this capacity. They didn't understand about the autonomic nervous system or the endocrine system, central nervous system. They didn't understand about immunity in those terms. They certainly didn't understand about cellular function and cellular physiology. So it's a, how they were able to come up with these insights is, is quite remarkable. And I think probably something that we will never see again, at least in, in modern culture. These people grew up in an environment where their forebears, their grandfathers and grandmothers were herbalists and they were born into it and from the time they were very young they were involved in this and they lived in small communities. They wildcrafted the herbs. They had a, a deeply uh, spiritual and familial relationship uh, and in growing in that environment they were able to achieve a great deal of intuition which we just don't have these days because of the distractions and the pressures and the, the stress. I mentioned before for example, that uh, it was in the paper today how people are dissatisfied with their work. And people are working on average about 50 hours a week. And as I pointed out, uh, traditional people, hunter-gatherers, work about 10 to 12 hours a week to get all of their needs met, food, shelter. And they have the rest of the time to sit around and talk. Even French peasants in the 17th and 18th century only worked on average about 22 hours a week where they would work obviously more in the spring and in the, in, the, in the autumn in harvest. But there was a lot of time. And one of the things about humans is our socialization. And we know by studies and by the way in which the brain works that we are capable of approximately 100 intimate relationships. I don't mean sexual, I mean intimate in an in in emotional sense. And the capacity to communicate with those people on a level in which we get feedback about ourselves and our relationships is, is pretty well established. Gorillas have a capacity of about 25 in there. And, that's the, and it determines the size of the community. And yet today we would find that most people have a community. Hey, come on in. 
Yeah, yeah, projector's here. I'm just rambling on, filling time. So I don't know what that is. Do you know what that is? It could be a resolution problem, but we'll soon find out. Thank you. I love technicians. Um, but one of the things, uh, where was I? You were in 100, 100 intimate relationships. Sorry? <laughs> oh, yeah, the site of communities. And, we, you know, and today we have people have, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all of these things, but these aren't really relationships in the sense of a traditional relationship that you would find in a traditional community, whether in China or in Italy or the Mediterranean countries, where you had that kind of ongoing community. And we, we seem to have lost something in, in in our technology, and I'm certainly not against technology. Hey, you've just filled the whole screen with light. Yeah. See that little corner? You did something, and then the whole screen got light. Well, I just unplugged it, that's all I've yeah. this point. <laughs> <laughs> if you plug it back in... You'll get the same thing. Yeah. Same thing, yeah. Right. Well, just one now. <laughs> okay. So the, the idea, anyway, of, of yeah. Porges, and, and also there was... Uh, uh, other people like McEwen, and, and they, they talk about how stress is, is a factor in modern life because stress is a factor that's associated with change. Stress is an indicator that we need to change, and if you're not changing, then the stress continues to go. Stress is a way of nudging us. It's an evolutionary factor. The capacity to adjust to stress is a factor and we get to change in terms of physical or psychological or mental evolution. So the, the fact that we grow by stress, it nudges us along. And yet most people want to get rid of stress, they want to medicate stress, which of course suppresses the stress function either by self-medication or pharmaceuticals or other factors. And when you de-stress yourself in this manner, you avoid the process of change. And I think this then becomes a pathology that be, is cultural. So we're told that we should not be stressed, and yet stress is something that is critically important to our growth. What, why do people get dementia? Why do people grow old? Of course, there is... <laughs> I think mostly that's true. <laughs> people give up. They shut down. The stress becomes something that is uh, too much for them to bear. And uh, so therefore they shut down and in one manner or another avoid the factors associated with stress. And I think this then becomes a, a, uh, a factor which one could suggest um, is the end of civilization. I mean, certainly we're looking at America and you're seeing the end of America. It's over with. You know, it's just finished. And it's not because there aren't smart people and clever people there. It's not because there isn't a great dynamism there. It is just because the minds are closed in many cases. Now, I'm not going to turn this into a political debate because I probably, uh, well, we're probably all of us pretty sympathetic to the reality of that. But in fact, when people don't change, when they try to go back to some romantic ideal of what we call the past, which never exists, you know where the memories exist? Sorry? <laughs> it's where they're formed. Memories don't exist. We make them up. Every time we try to remember something, it's a new creation. There is no filing card of memories in there going, oh yeah, I remember. Every time you re-remember, you're creating a new memory. And of course, as you do that, you lay down pathways, and those pathways become familiar. But each memory is new. And so the concept of going back and remembering, oh, those things were true. No, you just made that up. Just like, in fact, we made ourselves up. You know. <laughs> Where is I? Here? Or if you're Japanese, here? Where is I? Well, in fact, it's, it, it's just in the prefrontal lobes, if you intersect those two planes, it's a part of the brain that attempts to create congruity so that we are able to sustain a sense of continuity in our lives. I exist, my past is consistent. It's an illusion. It's a handy illusion because if every morning you woke up, thank you, 
and you had to remember yourself. What was that movie with, was it Goldie Hawn or some movie? No, no, it was, uh, sorry? Groundhog Day. Not Groundhog Day. That was a good one. 51st date. Sorry? 51st date. 51st date was, anyway, the woman kept on waking up in the morning and her family gave her the same newspaper that they've been giving her for. And it's kind of that way, you know, we are, that part of our brain is associated with a sense of continuity. Uh, the gentleman would like a couple of slides just to make just sure. To make sure. Sure. There we go. Uh, maybe a little bit larger if you can. Because of the video, when you start again, can you make that the real start? Sure. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to start again. 